we're throwing off the filters of tradition and culture to discover what the Bible really says about our relationships. Relationships with God, with ourselves, and with others. Welcome to this special episode of Relationship Truth Unfiltered. You'll want to be sure to stay to the very end to learn how you can be a part of Leslie's private membership community, Conquer, which is open to new members just this week. Thank you for joining us. I'm Julie Sedenko here with relationship expert, Leslie Vernick. And today we thought it would be a really special episode if we had Leslie answer your questions. So we have a whole list of questions that people have asked and Leslie, we're going to get started if that's okay with you. That sounds great. I hope I can oh, answer. Uh, you always do such a good job. Okay. So first, how do you deal with your husband? When you remove yourself either to a different room or a walk in the woods or even leaving the house, and he tells you, you're just running from your problems. You can deal with him in a number of different ways. One, you can ignore him. Um, He has his opinion, and you know why you left the room or you left the house to calm down or to collect your thoughts. Um, You might listen to him. Is that true? Are you running from your problems? Is this your way of coping when things get hot or hard and you just distance yourself or avoid it? Um, You can argue with him and say, that's not true. Why do you always call me names? Why do you always say those kind of things about me? Which probably will get you nowhere if he's the kind of husband that is kind of destructive and not really helpful or listening. Um, And you can remember that he may not always agree with your decisions, but you still have a right to make them. And so your decision to exit the conversation or exit the house or calm down or leave may be very justified and good reasons in your mind and may be very bad and unjustified reasons in his mind. And so this is where you have to begin to, uh, whether you do it with him or not may not be relevant, but you need to do it with you and validate yourself and say, I needed to do that. Just like if you had to go to the bathroom and you said, excuse me, I can't continue this conversation. I have to go to the bathroom. And they, oh, you don't have to go yet. You're, you, you should be able to hold a lot longer. What's wrong with you? You know, you wouldn't, you would think that was ridiculous. You're just running from your problems that you're making a bathroom excuse. No, if you need to do something to take care of you in order for you to be more present or more be able to answer questions or be in a conversation, then you would go do that. And nobody would criticize if you had a bathroom need. But if you have an emotional need and you need to calm down or you need to go think or you need to get a little space, um, somehow that's running from your problems. And so I would just clarify in your own mind why you left. And if there was any truth to what he said, is this your way of avoiding having a hard conversation or did you just need to calm down? And maybe it's some of both that a hard conversation never goes well with him. And so you have found it easier to end the conversation. And that might be the feedback you give him. You know, you might be right. I am running from our problems because our problem is, at least from my perspective, is that you don't really want to hear what I see as a problem in our marriage. And we never can talk about it in a constructive way. And so I've come to a place where I shut down and avoid it. So I'm not sure what the context is, but those any of those answers could fit. And if he just keeps denying what you're telling him, no, I don't, no, I don't. What, how do you deal with that? Well, you can go again in many different ways, but here would be two approaches. One is to say, okay, so let's then try. I'm sorry, I might be wrong. So let's have a hard conversation. I really want to talk about our finances. And I want to talk about why you keep taking money out of the ATM without telling me when we've agreed that you would tell me and that we would make decisions on finances mutually. And I see that there's been big withdrawals. And when we tried to talk about this in the past, it's never gone well. So um, I bringing it up now and see how it goes, right? So bring up a hard conversation and see if he can right in that moment, handle it. And if he can't, then I think you can say, well, this is kind of what I'm talking about when I say we really don't get anywhere because you're just deflecting that on me and blaming me and accusing me when you're really not willing to take a look at why you did what you did. I remember one time you told, I don't know if it was in a Facebook live or whatever, but you gave the advice of just saying, I don't agree. And that was just so simple of a response when they keep attacking and accusing and just, I don't agree. And what are they going to do? They can't make you agree. Mm -hmm. That's a very clever, soft way of just saying we are different 
and you see things your way, I see th- things my way, and I don't agree with you. And that is the best way after you've had a history of trying to get them to understand, trying to explain your point of view, trying to defend yourself about the way you do things or why you do things the way you do. And there is no understanding or, oh, okay, now I understand. There's none of that. There's just more arguing. Um, the best thing is to say, we just have to agree to disagree. You're not going to understand, or I, I accept that you don't understand, or you don't agree. I accept that. And really do accept that, that we're not going to see eye to eye on this. My husband, well, and I just had one of those conversations yesterday and we, you know, he was saying, I just want your support. And I said, well, how would you like my support when I don't agree with your decision? So to be able to say, maybe I could support you if you gave me some clues of how that would feel for you, but I still don't agree with your decision. Leslie, this woman is really having a very difficult time making a decision about her marriage. She says, my husband has been verbally and sexually abusing me for years. I told him I want a separation a month and a half ago. He finally moved to another room a month ago and started going to therapy, church, acting nicer, helping around the house. I see he is acting better, but I don't feel differently. I told him so, and he got very upset and said, if I don't want to work on it, I need to start paying my way. What am I to do if I can't get the feelings back? All I have is trauma and pain. So one of the things I'm really concerned about is that when you finally had the courage to tell him what you really felt and asked for what you wanted, I mean, eventually he did move out, but he didn't really seem to show much care for the impact that that had on you over the years, that it caused you trauma and pain. And yes, he might be going to counseling and going to church and acting nicer, but when you harm someone and they say, finally, you've harmed me, ouch, this hurts, stop, don't, you need to move out of the bedroom. And he expects you to instantly be fine because he's not doing it now, but he has no care for the impact that he's caused you all those years. It's telling me that he still doesn't get it. So you have two choices. One is you can say to him, you have no idea the damage that you caused all these years. It doesn't change and heal in a month and see what he says. Um, Because it sounds like he's saying, hey, if you're not willing to partner with me in making our marriage better, I don't know why I'm doing this. And that may not be what he's saying, but that sounds like what he's saying. And so if, if that is what he's saying, I think you can say, I don't know whether I can partner with you because I need to see some real change in you. And I haven't had long enough time to see any real change in you. And when I'm telling you that I'm still feeling pretty traumatized by what happened, you don't seem to care. You just want me to get on with it. And that bothers me. Like if you crashed our car and I was in intensive care and I was in physical therapy, it might take me longer than a month to help to get better. So you're expecting me to be all better and have loving feelings towards you in a month. That's not, that's not going to happen for me. There is a a, a aspect of PTSD in a destructive relationship, isn't there? I mean, even if a man is trying to get better and maybe he's been financially abusive every month when you have to pay the bills of his fraudulent loans and everything, I know that that's the woman's thing that she has to do her own work and taking care of that. But shouldn't also the husband understand that his actions and his abuse, even if he's not continuing continuing them, still do impact her? Yeah. And sometimes the consequences are that the impact is long lasting. So when someone, you know, traumatizes you, whether it's, you know, let's just use a very concrete example. They're, They're driving road rage and they get in an accident and it costs you and you have a broken leg. That broken leg takes time to heal and it doesn't go away just because you're sorry. It doesn't stop hurting just because he's saying, oh, I'll never drive like that again. And maybe he won't ever drive like that again. Or maybe you're just sitting in the car on the way to a doctor's appointment 30 days later and he's starting to get a little hot under the collar because someone's driving too slow. And it's triggering a memory from you from 30 days ago when you got in a car wreck. And you say to him, I'm feeling scared and can you please slow down? And he says, what is wrong with you? You're so unforgiving. Instead of, of course, I'll slow down. I don't want to ever scare you again. You see, so the man who says what's wrong with you has no idea or refuses to acknowledge the impact that he's caused. Or just doesn't want to have you bring it up again because it hurts when you bring up his 
the past and how it hurts and just stop talking about it. But she didn't bring up the past. She brought up the moment. I'm scared right now. Right. You're driving scary because it triggered that memory, but it also triggered her feelings. Didn't just trigger a memory. She's scared right now. And the fact that he didn't care about the impact that that crash caused her in the here and now shows something is disconnected for him, whether it's shame, whether it's, you know, belligerence, pride, we don't know. And that's not her job to figure it out, but it tells her that he's still unwilling to really understand the damage he's caused because a man or a woman who's caused a lot of damage. Like I remember when I would yell at my kids and I decided I wasn't going to be that kind of mommy anymore. Cause I saw them have scared faces. Like, Oh my gosh, mom's really losing her mind. <laughs> I didn't want to be that kind of mom. Um, I gave my kids permission to tell me if I was ever scaring them. And when they told me, mom, you're scaring me, I would stop. And I would listen and I'd say, even if I didn't feel I was about to lose control, if they felt scared, I'd stop and say, all right, I'm going to take a time out. And that rebuilt our trust that, oh, mommy cares that I feel this way. She doesn't want to be this way anymore. And that's what you're trying to do in a relationship, in a marriage where there's been serious damage is do you care that you hurt me? And are you aware of what that feels like if it's starting to happen again? And if you don't, then there's not a lot of hope for that relationship to be healthy. Here's another woman, Leslie, that is kind of in a decision-making stage. She says, my marriage falls into the deeply disappointing rather than the destructive category. It is so hard to know what to do because the thought of making an exit seems to be for my own comfort or the possibility to find someone more compatible. And that seems selfish and like not reason enough to me. Please give me your thoughts about this. Without knowing any details about what this deeply disappointing looks like, I would say maybe she's right. Maybe she is just feeling like, oh, this is boring. He's boring. Um, you know, he's not as romantic or as thoughtful or as financially motivated to get a better job. And I thought we would live in a better house by now, or he's not, you know, a good conversationalist. We can never have deep conversations, whatever you're disappointed about. Um, I think there's a lot to learn about people and learning to love the person they are, not the person you thought they were or who you wanted them to be. So I do think that disappointment in a marriage, just like our kids disappoint us, they're not the kids that we wanted, or they're not the kids we thought they should be or would be or could be. How do we love and how do we still maintain our family and show that love for people who aren't what we thought they should be or aren't they aren't what we thought that we wanted? Um, I think there's a there's a, a great maturity in learning to love the person as they are and who they are, as long as they're not damaging to you and destructive to you or to others. Um, but I think that takes a bit of self-work to be able to really understand that marriage isn't about only comfort and romantic love or whatever else you're missing. Marriage is about creating a stable family life for children to grow up in safety and trust. And if you have safety and trust in the relationship, you might not have a whole lot of other things. You might not have deep romance. You might have not deep, might not have deep connection. You might not have you know, a barrel of laughs together, you might not have a lot of other things. But if you have safety and trust in a relationship in a family, I don't think that's a reason to break a family apart. Leslie, we're about to open Conquer, open the doors to your private membership group that we call Conquer. One of the things that you talk about a lot is doing your own work. And I know a lot of women who are in destructive marriages think that they're going to join Conquer and they're going to find out how to fix their marriage, how to fix their husband, how to get him to do his work because he's sure not doing it. But you spend a lot more time talking about how to work on yourself. So what is this self-care, self-work exactly? What does it look like? Well, I think it, it starts with, you know, understanding that it's easy to see what's wrong with him. And you might be a hundred percent correct in what's wrong with him. But obviously, if you're joining Conquer, you have felt pretty powerless in changing him. But because the Bible is very clear that people do impact us and people do influence us, nowhere more so than in a close relationship like marriage, you have been impacted by the destruction in your marriage. And so you're going to need some 
healing. You're going to need some clarity in the way that you think biblically about all of this. You're going to need some understanding of what it looks like to steward your own life and your safety, um, both not just physically, if you're in danger, but financially and, and socially. How do I pick good friends? How do I have good boundaries? All of those kind of things. And that's your own work to do. That's not something that you can do for him. It's something that you can do for yourself. And so we talk a lot about that because not only has he influenced and impacted you, but as you grow and change, you have the opportunity to influence and impact him. And I have to say that as you do your own work, if you do it in the right way and in God's way, um, you can still love your husband. God calls us to love our enemies. Um, doesn't mean we can trust them. It doesn't mean we have to live with them. But by you doing your own work and growing and maturing and being the woman that God calls you to be, um, that might influence your husband to want some of that too. It also might infuriate him because the Bible does say that the darkness hates the light. And so that will make things more clear for you as you do your work and keep your side of the street clean. It's not a situation where, well, I'm a mess and he's a mess and I've sinned against him and he sinned against me. It's no, I know that I kept my side of the street clean. And what he's doing wrong is much more clear, not only to me, but to my people helpers, my pastoral staff, my children, so that nobody gets confused about why I'm leaving. They understand, at least to the best of my ability to make that happen. We have several questions on this whole topic of working on self. And one of them, or a couple of them actually, is talking about becoming self-aware. What is a baby step that people can put into practice to be self-aware? And also, how do you be self-aware when someone's gaslighting you? Because it can get very, very confusing. Mm -hmm. So let's just talk about the, the, the whole idea of self-awareness. Self-awareness is part of maturing. Um, we grow in self-awareness our whole lives. It never ends. It's, a, it's a, something that we start to, start to do in, as an infant. So we become aware that we're different than mommy, that she, her body is not our body. When we're an infant, we just assume she and us are the same. Just like when we were internal in her womb, we don't, we don't differentiate. And so as we start to become more self-aware around the ages of like peekaboo, like, oh, she's there. She's not there. I'm there. I'm not there. Um, or when we run away from mommy, it's like, oh, my body can separate from your body. I'm aware that I'm separate from you. I'm different than you. And then they start to learn language and they say, what, this gigantic word, their first boundary. No, 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 I have a no. <laughs> and that's a sense of self-awareness. And then what the mother does to help a child mature even further around that age is she helps them become self-aware about their body. Like, do you have to go to the bathroom? How about we try to go in the potty? And so she begins to help them become aware of when they have to go to the bathroom so that they don't pee in their pants and they don't poop in their diaper and they go in the toilet. And these are all maturing steps. Well, how do you teach a child to start paying attention to their body? They used to just go whenever they had the urge. Now they have to hold it and they have to wait and they have to go to the toilet. And sometimes they're good at that. And sometimes they're not so good at that because that's the part of learning. But no child, by the time that they're 10 years old, is regularly peeing their pants. And if they were, there'd be something wrong with that child. They would be immature. Sometimes, you know, five-year-olds might still have an accident. They're playing, they're not paying attention. And all of a sudden they have to pee themselves because they didn't notice that they had to go to the bathroom. Well, in the same way as moms raising kids, we're teaching our kids not only to notice their bladders are full, but, oh, you notice that you're hungry right now. Look, you haven't eaten and you're cranky and you're crabby and you're crying you must need to eat, you're hungry, or you're tired, or you're angry. And so we're labeling things that a child feels physiologically, whether it's emotional feelings or biological feelings, and we're putting a name to it so that a child then can begin to become self-aware. I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm angry, right? I feel sad. And these are really important skills for all of us to have. Now, some families do a better job at this than others, but if you're a grown up at this point, biologically and in number, you're in your 20s or your 30s, and you don't know how to label what you feel or what you want or what you need, um, that's probably been because you didn't practice that in childhood. Probably you're not going to the bathroom in your pants. So you do know how to do that. But it may be emotionally, you're just exploding and you didn't even know it was coming. 
the same as if you were to just explode in your pants and didn't even know it was coming. Of course you knew it was coming because you know how to pay attention. So the basic first steps in self-awareness is starting to pay attention. And one of the things that keeps us from paying attention is we're so easily distracted. We're using our cell phones, we're talking to people, we're watching TV, we're listening to the radio, we're just not paying attention. And so one of the practices that I encourage people to start become more self-aware is just to stop even for 30 seconds or a minute, a couple of times a day, and just ask yourself, what do I see? What do I feel? And what do I hear? And just pay attention, start to notice, be aware. Be self-aware, pay attention to your body. What do I feel? If I were just to name that right now, if I I wasn't paying attention, but if I, now that I'm paying attention, my legs are crossed and one of them is starting to fall asleep. I didn't notice that until I just started to pay attention. Like I'm paying attention to my body. I also have an itch on my back, which I didn't notice, but now I notice since I was paying attention. So you could do that with your body. Like, what does my body feel right now? What does my heart feel like right now? What do my emotions feel like right now? And just pay attention. You know, the the psalmist says, he was self-aware. He said, why am I downcast, oh, my soul? Well, how could he even ask himself that question if he wasn't paying attention? And in Proverbs chapter five, it says a very interesting verse that I think is so critical to our growth. It's talking about the foolish woman, the adulterous woman, and understanding Proverbs written for a young man by his father. Um, And so he's talking about, be careful about these women. It's also true for men as well to be careful, um, for women to be careful of those men. But it's talking about this, this adulterous woman and it says, she's walking down a crooked path and she doesn't even know it. And that's the sadness of folly is that people who live foolishly and destructively and uh, live for pleasure or comfort often are blind yeah. to even what they're doing. They don't see it. And Jesus says, you know, that when your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is dark, you're not having good self-awareness. And so self-awareness is something you practice. It's also something that you need other people for. So I can't see myself clearly all by myself. And all of us as women can relate to this because what do you do? You look in the mirror. Right? You go in the mirror and you say, oh my gosh, I have crackers stuck in my teeth. You know, I don't want to show up smiling with all that gook in my teeth. You wouldn't have known that all by yourself. You might've been able to feel a little bit with your tongue, but you see it much clearly. You have lipstick on your teeth. You would have never been able to feel that. You only can see that by looking in a lighted mirror. And so having people in our lives who we trust, who can give us accurate feedback about ourselves is also a way of gaining self-awareness. It reminds me, I remember driving in the car one time and something, you know, behind my shoulder was bothering me. So I was just feeling back there and suddenly I felt this huge lump and it scared me, especially because, you know, I have some cancer history and I just thought immediately, I mean, I, I was planning my funeral. It was huge. And I went in to the doctor and it was uh, something called a lipoma, mm-hmm. which is just, you know, it's like a fat tumor or deposit or whatever, and they easily removed it. But that was an area that, you know, when I'm in the shower, I usually have one of those scrunchies or a back brush. So I don't feel back in that specific area. I don't see it. I would have never known that it was there unless somebody could have told me or just because I happened to be, you know, searching back there for the cause of my whatever discomfort or itch or whatever it was. So It just is a picture that I hope is somewhat helpful that sometimes to pay more attention to those areas that maybe we just don't think about. Uh, Sometimes it is mm -hmm, good to do an inventory of ourselves and also to have wise others speak into our lives. Hebrews 3.13 says, let us encourage one another day after day, lest any one of us become hardened by the deceit and loss of sin. And so I say that one of the most important truth tellers in your life, if you have a healthy marriage, is your spouse. Yes. You know, because because maybe he would have felt that on your back if he were hugging you. Or um, if I have bad breath, the first person who's going to know that is my husband. When I'm not acting as a good mom or I'm acting selfishly or pridefully or destructively, the person who's going to see that are the people I live with. And if they don't have the freedom to give me that feedback, mom, you're scaring me or, 
you know, wife, I think you're getting a little full of yourself or whatever it is that we give each other feedback when it's not pretty feedback, you have bad breath or those kind of things. You know, none of us like to hear it. The ego gets wounded, but the Bible tells us faithful are the wounds of a friend. And they're telling us this information to make us better people. And this, this goes back to the whole idea for a woman in a destructive marriage. Your role in your wife is not to feed your husband's ego or to build him up in a way that's not realistic. Your job as your husband's helpmate is to help him see himself clearly, both his strengths and his weaknesses. I mean, I'm grateful for people in my life who saw my strengths as a speaker and as a as a leader and as a as a writer because I didn't see them. I right. didn't see them. Other people saw them and they said, you know, you have these strengths. We want, you know, to help you develop them. I didn't see them, but there's also things I don't see about my weaknesses, right? That I might be too much of a people pleaser. I might be too accommodating, or I might be too um, critical. Those kinds of things can, can be very important feedback. And if we don't have the freedom in our marriage to give our spouse feedback, like, Hey, you were really harsh with the kids, or I'm not happy with the way that you talk to them right now. That was really um, I would I'll call it borderline emotional abuse. And I don't like that. And if they're a healthy person, they're not going to like that you told them, but they're going to be grateful. They're going to be grateful the same way someone's grateful that they give you a tic tac and said, you bat, you know, you have bad breath. It's embarrassing. It's a little humiliating. You don't like it, but you're grateful that this person knows you enough to know that you would want to take a tic tac and improve that. What if you instead of having somebody that's offering you a tic tac is and you're you're trying this trying to be more self aware practicing those steps that you said but they're constantly gaslighting you maybe you're trying to give feedback to him and he's constantly telling you you're bad it's all your fault we wouldn't have any problems if you would just shut up so this is really important that we don't only have one truth teller in our life right yes. so because because they may have an agenda as to why they say what they say, whether they're jealous of you or threatened by your, you know, independence or threatened by your gifts or don't like what you had to say. So they're going to call you critical instead of taking a hard look at themselves. And so it's very important that you have a group of wise others. The Bible talks about having wise others in your life, not just one wise other, but wise others so that you can compare um, and this is just a really great illustration of this. When I heard from people that I was a, a decent writer and that I had something to say and that I should write a book, it was terrifying, but I really believed God had called me to do that. He called me and I didn't believe it, but then people began to speak up and confirm that to me. And I never said a word about him calling me. So it was okay, God, you're letting me know that this is from you and I should do this. So when I finally got the nerve to put out a book proposal, which you had to do, I didn't know that you should only send it to one publisher at a time. I didn't know that. So I sent it to 12 publishers. Oh, thinking no. that hopefully maybe one would like me. I didn't have an agent or anything. I was just green, totally green. I didn't know what I was doing, but I didn't hear from some of them. I never heard back, but I did get um, several rejection letters. And some of those rejection letters were very kind. You know, we loved your proposal. We think it has good potential, but it doesn't fit with our, you know, marketing objectives for this year, or it's not, doesn't fit with our uh, theological position. For example, I'm not a Pentecostal. If I sent it to a Pentecostal type publication, they're not going to, you know, publish my book because it doesn't have some of those things in it. Um, so, and I didn't know any better, but one criticism that I got was, we suggest that you hire a ghostwriter. You might be a good speaker, but you don't know how to write. Oh, and, that's, so, so that's, that's terrible. Speaking. I know wow. <laughs> that was terrible. And I was just so grateful because had I only sent out one and if it was that one, it would have been confident. And I got that one back. I would have said, it's, I'm crazy. Of course I can't write. I knew that. That's what I would have said. And so I think it's really important, especially when you live with someone who is very critical of you or gaslighting you or saying, you know, hey, everybody does this. You're overreacting. This isn't true. I don't think you're right. You know, if if I watch a little porn, there's nothing wrong with that. This isn't really bad. You know, and you start thinking, wow, maybe I grew up in this crazy home that thought things were bad that aren't bad. And you start losing sight of your true north, both your true north and God's true north when you have a very charming, convincing liar. It's happened to the best of people. I mean, look at yes. what's happening in the church recently with all the church leaders that have fallen on 
disrepute because of the skill of their deceit. And so there are very good liars out there. The Bible calls them wolves in sheep's clothing. And so it's easy to get confused and confounded. And so that's why it's so important to have multiple wise others that you can go to so that you might say, so when I had 12 letters, some of them rejection, but only one of the 12 said I couldn't write. And I actually got three book proposal offers to publish my book. But had I not done that and just heard that one, I would have believed it. And so I think it is easy to get confused when you only have one other voice in your head. Um, and that's really the structure of cultish kind of isolation is they only want you to listen to their voice because if you start listening to other voices, you're going to start to say, hmm, wow, I never thought about it that way. I think it's really important to watch different news stations. If you're a Fox fan, turn on CNN. If you're a CNN yeah. fan, turn on Fox, turn on BBC. Listen to other points of view so that you're not being gaslit because our whole nation is being gaslit oh, yes. right yeah. now. And so- this is your responsibility. It is your responsibility to seek truth, know truth, find truth, love truth. And it's also wise to know that Satan is the father of lies. And so, and lies can easily masquerade as the truth. And so if you're learning to be more self-aware, you need other people to help you. And some of those people may not be accurate mirrors. Just like if I looked in the mirror of a funny mirror, right? So I look in the mirror and I see myself and I think, oh my gosh, I'm anorexic. I only weigh like 85 pounds. I look terrible, but that's not true. It's a distorted mirror. But if that was my only mirror or one of those wide mirrors that make you look like you weigh 400 pounds and that's, and that's what I believed. It's not true. It's not true. And so be careful of your truth tellers and have more than one so that if you do need feedback about something and you're saying, Hey, my husband says I'm overly critical when I say this, or my husband says that I'm a prude because I don't want to do this in the bedroom. And maybe I am, or maybe I'm not, but I just need some feedback. What's normal. What's not normal. Is it normal for your husband to call you these filthy names and then expect you to want to have sex? I think these are questions that we have to have the freedom to ask our girlfriends and be able to check out and ask other churches, hey, my pastor says this, but does every pastor say this? I think is that's one of the best that? things about Conquer is mm -hmm. because you have this incredible community where anytime, day or night, because we've got members that are all over the world. So they're up and you mm -hmm. can go on there and you can ask a question like that. And nobody, nobody's going to put you down for it. Right. And they're, you're going to get lots of different perspectives and advice and I think that's probably one of, at least when I am interviewing women who've been a part of Conquer, they say that's always one of the best parts of being a part of that program. It is because there's total freedom to ask these questions because you're on Facebook, so you don't have to see them face to face. Yes. What's so interesting is you get a multitude of different responses. Not yes. It's the same. And so you see that right away. Like, wow, we don't all think the same about everything. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Well, here's another one. It's kind of a, a lady that wants to work on herself, but also trying to make a decision. And uh, she says, I've been doing this for quite some time. And I've noticed that it's just getting worse. I'm terrified to leave. I have no family and desire to know how to get over this intense fear of leaving. Yeah, fear can be a real boogeyman. And it also can be a very wise teacher. Yes. So here's where you're going to have to decide what is your fear telling you? So if I'm sitting here right now and I'm hearing someone trying to break down my door, I'm going to feel fear. And my fear is telling me danger, danger, danger. Someone's trying to break down your door, get out. So I'm going to, my body is going to move into alarm mode I'm not going to be thinking about the podcast. I'm not going to be thinking about anything other than flee. The prudent see danger, Proverbs says, and take refuge. So fear is a God-given biological response to danger. Now, sometimes it's a false alarm, like when you jump and you thought you saw a snake and it turned out to be a rope, or you thought you saw a bug and it didn't turn out to be a bug. It was just a speck of dust. But it is that warning sign of danger so that you get safe. Safety is important to God. He's hardwired into your biology. But fear can also be 
something that is unseen and unknown. It's just, we're afraid of what might happen. We're afraid of failing. We're afraid of looking stupid. We're afraid of being wrong. We're afraid of um, rejection. We're afraid of disappointing someone. We're afraid of God being mad at us if we do the wrong thing. And so there's all these boogeymen of fear. And so I think it's really important that if that's the case for you, if you're in literal danger, like if your husband has told you, if you leave, I will come and get you and kill you. If he's made threats to himself or to you about your safety, um, your fear is legitimate and you need a safety plan. I remember working with a woman who came to me because she was scared to death. She had her husband was in a road rage incident with her. And he said, I'm going to kill us both in the road rage. And that was scary enough. But then she started looking on his computer and she found a history of him. And he was a very big tech person in a, in a pretty big company. And he, she started finding history of how can you murder your wife without getting oh, caught or how wow. can you get away with killing your wife? And, um, and it terrified her. And so she needed to find a safety plan and get out. And we worked on a safety plan for her to, you know, actually leave and not tell anybody where she was. Her children didn't know where she was. She had to get her car and her money and all the kinds of things together. But she needed to leave because her fear was real. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, so many of us have a fear. I can't live alone. I'll never find a job. Um, I don't know how to do this. I've never had to support myself. I've never had to take care of myself. I don't know what I'm doing. And so these are like boogeyman fear that keep you stuck and paralyzed in indecision. And so in Conquer, we talk a lot about that. And the first thing that you need when you have that kind of fear is the support that you need and other women who have taken the journey that can show you the way. I remember, um, Julie, when Leanne and Jessica and I went camp, uh, not camping, we went hiking and Leanne and Jessica are part of our team and they live in this area. So we have beautiful hiking trails and they decided they wanted to go to Camelback Mountain uh, to hike it. And I was new to Arizona and I'd only hiked once before in my entire life. I was at least 10 years older than Leanne and 20 or 30 years older than Jessica. So I wasn't quite sure about this, but I thought, yeah. oh, I'm game, I'll go. And, you know, Camelback is one of the most dangerous hikes. There's a helicopter pad for people who get frozen up there because it's very steep. It's very sharp. You can fall and die on this hike. Um, and they're going up like, you know, soldiers. And all I'm doing is praying my heart out and following in their footsteps. I was scared the whole way up and scared the whole way down, but I made it up and I made it down and I've never done it again. I don't know if I'll ever do it again, but I did it. I took my picture up there. And my point is, is that sometimes life is terrifying and it is too hard for you to do alone. And I would have never climbed Camelback all by myself, but I could climb Camelback following two other people who were stronger and then I was and had done it before. And so as I just put my foot where they put their feet, I was able to get up and get down safely. And so my point is, is that connect with other women who are going through this, whether you join Conquer, whether you become a part of a support group in your church, whether you go to a domestic violence shelter um, and get some support there, go where there are women who have walked where you are walking and can give you some confidence and some pointers and some help in the journey forward. So I think that's your first step is to get, face your fear, name it, get some support. And I think naming it can be really helpful. Like, what am I most afraid of? What am I afraid is gonna happen if I fail? What am I afraid is gonna happen if I take a stand? What am I afraid is gonna happen? And then begin really talking yourself through that because sometimes it's the unnamed anxiety that just overwhelms you. But if you really say what scares me the most about this, living alone, for example, yeah. Okay. What's so scary about living alone? Well, I've never done it before. What am I most scared of? I don't know. I've never had to be my own company. Well, how could you learn to be your own company? How could you learn to feel safer about that? How could you learn to perhaps get a roommate or live in an apartment building where there's other people that you could see at the pool or see on a walk or whatever you do? Um, how can you make more friends at work? Those kind of things so that you're starting to tackle your fear instead of being overwhelmed by it. Your story about hiking reminded me of when we were driving on Highway 1 in California last summer, and it's just literally been there, done the, that. The cliff was in the back seat with my head down. And I just, you know, I was just loving it. Of course, I'm in the driver's seat. And even it, the, the cliff is so close on, on the passenger side of the car that the little uh, sensor that says you're going to get in an accident kept going off just because we had to be that close to the mountain to not be, you know, go off the cliff. 
anyway, we pulled over at a rest stop and I, I said to my kids, like, isn't this beautiful? And my oldest said, it could be better. And I thought, are you kidding me? I said, how could it possibly be better? And she said, a guardrail. <laughs> she was terrified the entire time. She hated it. I was drive. too. I can't, I can't even... When I'm in those situations, I can't even look. And I, and I'm, all I'm doing is looking at the driver and I'm saying, keep your eyes on the road, keep your eyes on the road. Cause they're <laughs> wanting to look. And I'm like, Do I you know. not turn your head. <laughs> I want to sit in the back seat, hold their head straight. <laughs> and I can't yeah. look. Yep. Well, and, and two, I have to say this, this woman that we, I interviewed uh, early on in our podcast, Alicia, if you want to look it up, the episode is called married to a sexually abusive pastor. And this is a woman I think that is such a story of facing her fears and being so courageous and brave because she was a mother of six kids and paralyzed and she in a wheelchair in a wheelchair. Yeah. And had to leave her sexually abusive pastor. I mean, she tried and tried and tried, but he was not doing the work and she has since left and she's thriving. Has it been easy? No but she did it. So it's a, it's a really encouraging story. If, if that's something that you're struggling with another question, I'm going to go to one. That's a little bit more theological. The burning question in my heart is I said for better or for worse in my marriage vows, do I have the right to be rejecting him being for worse? Well, I don't think if you were in your right mind, when you said those vows, that you were saying, and there's actually a spoof YouTube on this very thing where a couple is saying their vows together. And she's saying, I vow to let you treat me with disrespect, to abuse our children, to spend all of our money without any knowledge that I have. I promise that you can watch all the porn you want (laughs) until death do us part. You aren't promising that. No, you promise for better or for worse. You wouldn't be in your right mind if you promised that anything goes, you can do whatever you want to me and our children, and I will always stay married to you. But the pastors teach it, Leslie. That's what drives me crazy. They teach it. I don't think they're in their right mind when they think it and teach it. That's not really what God's word says. Even God doesn't, I just read in my devotion today, Jeremiah three, and God's saying, I'm breaking covenant with you because you are cheating on me. You're worshiping other idols. I'm not having it. We can't have a relationship. And so God is calling unfaithfulness in their worship of other gods. He's calling it adultery. And I think that unfaithfulness is always a metaphor. Adultery is always a metaphor for unfaithfulness. So I don't think you're saying when you make those vows for better or for worse, you can lie to me, you can cheat on me, you can abuse me, you can threaten our children, you can sexually abuse our children, but I will be such a big person. I will be so magnanimous that I will do even more than God will do. And I will always be in relationship with you. That's just not true. It's not realistic. It's not healthy. And I don't really think that's what you promised. So first of all, the for better or for worse vows are not in the Bible. They are in the book of common prayer. So remember the Bible tells you don't make rash vows. (laughs) So this is what you're struggling with. You made a vow that isn't even in the Bible. And now it's coming back to bite you in terms of feeling guilty. Second of all, I don't think that's what you were promising in your heart of hearts when you made that vow for better or for worse sort of means if we go through a financial hard time, if you get sick, if you get paralyzed, if you have a heart attack, when we get really old and ugly and nobody's appealing to each other sexually, I'm still going to love you. And I'm going to still stay with you. Even if you lose your hair, you lose your teeth, all the kind of things that happen as we get old, get saggy and, and wrinkly, I'm going to still be here for you because that's what I promise. I think that's the promise that you made. And I think that's probably the promise you can keep. But when someone says I'm allowed to act like a an adulterer, a liar, a cheater, an abuser, an oppressor, and somehow you're supposed to stay married to me, that's not only disrespecting you, you're disrespecting yourself. You're actually enabling him to be his worst self by saying it's okay. And it's not okay. And actually, if you were going to be a good wife, biblically, the Bible uses that word, uh, the helper, 
not to mean a enabler, but a strong warrior that fights for the best version of someone. And so if you put up with the worst version of him, how is that helping him recognize that it's not just toxic to you and the kids, it's toxic and destructive to him and the person that he was called to be? Why would you do that if you want to be a good wife? Thank you so much for answering these questions. I think for our audience, we're going to try to do this every few months. I will put a link in the show notes where you can ask your questions. And Leslie, thank you for always being such a source of good common sense and biblical wisdom. We appreciate you. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on Relationship Truth Unfiltered. If you have a question for Leslie, leave a comment on this episode or leave a comment on Leslie's YouTube page. The link will be in the show notes. And if you'd like to join Conquer, go to leslievernick.com forward slash join. Doors close at midnight, April 21st.